Can I help you, ma'am? Well, they, they told me to take a streetcar named Azaria. <laughs> When I look at a streetcar named Desire, my mind always goes inevitably towards the confrontational aspects of the play, and I find myself looking at it in a similar way that I do to revenge plays such as Hamlet or Othello, an old school tragedy. I mean, for one thing, when you look at the four main characters of the play, you already find a setup for the bloody contest that will soon unfold. With Blanche Dubois, for example, you have a figment of a bygone era one associated with the magical fantasy of the world rather than what they view as a bitter and harsh reality. I don't want realism, I want magic. Magic. Yes, yes, magic. I try to give that to people. I do misrepresent things. I don't tell truth. I tell what ought to be truth, and if that is sinful, then let me be punished for it. Don't turn the light on. She's ruled completely by her philosophies and finds herself unable to compromise her necessity for illusion with the bitter reality of life. Now, pitted against her on the other end of the spectrum is the equally transfixed Stanley Kowalski, who finds himself a slave to action and raw instinct. A brutish man with a bit of a cruel streak, Stanley can be viewed as somewhat of a champion in the respect that he is a man of unwavering honesty. All of his words and actions are entirely intended, and nothing infuriates him more than a liar. Would you think it possible that I was once considered to be attractive? He looks okay. How oh, efficient for a compliment, Stanley. I don't go in for that stuff. What stuff? The compliments to women about the looks. I never met a dame yet didn't know if she was good looking or not without being told. And there's some of them that give themselves credit for more than they've got. I once went out with a dame who told me I'm the glamorous type. She says, I am the glamorous type. I says, so what? And uh, what did she say then? She didn't say nothing. I shut her up like a clam. With the constant presence of Blanche, Stanley finds himself inexorably compelled to out her true colors, in a similar way that Blanche cannot face the truth. As such, the two are in constant and consistent conflict, which drives the story all the way to its bitter conclusion, thus setting up the whole bloody contest that revenge tragedies are famous for. From another standpoint, A Streetcar Named Desire takes this early tragic structure in the sense that this bloody conflict between Stanley and Blanche inevitably comes at the sacrifice and pain of those around them. This can be seen most especially when looking at Mitch and Stella, who are the most deeply wounded by the entire affair. In the case of the former, Mitch is as honest a man as Stanley, albeit with a bigger heart and a greater capacity to be gentle. With a dying mother and a biting loneliness, Mitch falls for Blanche's charms and becomes completely attached to her, making him a vulnerable target for Stanley's assault on her. The end result causes Mitch to become entirely disillusioned with Blanche and painfully thrust her out of his heart and mind in a fantastic confrontation where he tries to get the truth from her, but inevitably fails. Oh, I don't mind you being older than what I thought, but... But all the rest... Oh. Why, they, they pitch about your ideals being so old-fashioned and, and all the malarkey that you've been dishing out all summer. Or, or I knew you weren't 16 anymore, but I was fool enough to believe you were straight. Equally detrimental is the situation of Stella, who is forced to wait on her alcoholic sister Blanche out of compassion for who she once was. This provides great strain not only from Blanche, whose lies and judgments permeate Stella's mind as easily as they do the walls of the house, but from Stanley as well, whose frustrations and animosities towards Blanche violently manifest themselves in bitter arguments and physical altercations with the spouse. All of this serves in breaking down the once happy marriage between Stella and Stanley, even to the extent that it malforms their child's birth with the infamous rape scene. How well have you... Rough us, huh? All right, let's have a little rough us. Tiger, tiger, rub them, bottle top. At the end of it all, both Stella and Mitch are left as broken shadows of what they once were, and pitiful players in a tragic duel to the death. 
This duel in question doesn't lead to the demise of any person in particular, save maybe for Blanche's own mind, but it remains a costly and torrential one for all those involved nonetheless. None of these characters will ever completely recover from these horrible altercations, and as such, this Tennessee Williams play remains for me as much of a bitter tragedy as any classic that came before it. Some may consider it a character study, or hail it for its realistic themes of truth versus illusion, but all I can ever see it as is that heartfelt, if not entirely unexpected, tragedy.